Right. Why don't why don't we just start by saying hi to each other? Why don't you just say hi in the chat? And I'm just really curious to know out of the almost 200 of us here, which state do you represent? Where are you right now? Why don't you just say hi and say where are you signing in from? Yes, I don't see any messages yet, but no worries, no worries. You know, tonight is going to be a really exciting, really interesting night. We're, we're, we're going to have a forum um, and it's going to be a special forum. We're going to have uh, different ones from uh, ge different generations on this forum. And we're going to be talking about a really interesting topic. Where are the next gen leaders? Where are the next gen leaders? And yes, good evening. Hi from uh, to Si Kien from Penang. Yeah, yeah. Shalom, blessings to all. Yes, so good. So yeah, we're we're gonna start uh, in a little bit. But yeah, let me just open even this time with a word of prayer as you continue to say hi to each other. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Yes, Lord. Father, we want to thank you even for tonight. Uh, we, we are just so grateful even for this platform that you have. You are the one that has birth even during the pandemic. Father, we are just so grateful that it is your hand upon this nation, your grace and your mercy upon this nation that you have birthed even this platform for such a time as this. And Lord, we just don't want to take it for granted that we can be even in this space, even though we may be physically uh, separated by the distance, but we are united by the Spirit even tonight. And even the different states that are represented here, and maybe perhaps even different nations that may be coming in to join on this Zoom call later, God, we are asking God that may there be such a, a, a reverence and an honor that will be lifted up to your name even this evening across our nation. God, even tonight we are asking, Lord, that even as we turn and fix our gaze upon you, the Lamb that was slain, God, Father, may our hearts just be so ignited, oh God, by what it is that you're saying to us even in this hour. God, we recognize even the times that we're living in. We, we recognize just the different things that are just happening all around us, whether they are really good things or even things that, that are just really shocking and saddening and things that break our hearts. But God, in this place, we know that we can come gathered as your children. We can come gathered as the body of Christ in this nation, standing as it were on the walls, like watchmen on the walls, just looking to you, looking and gazing upon the one who was slain. And so even tonight, God, we are asking, would you open the eyes of our heart? Father, we say we just want to posture ourselves in a way that we would just lean in. Even as we behold you, we want to lean into your heart. God, I, I'm asking, Lord, that even as we gather here, open our hearts to you, open our hearts to one another. Lord God, we're standing in a threshold of history, we're standing in a threshold of time where things can shift one way or another. But as your people, God, we are saying, well, Lord, we want to respond to what heaven is saying, what heaven is decreeing over us as a nation in this hour. And we, God, we want to respond in a timely manner, we want to respond in the right posture. We want to respond because we know that you're moving and we want to respond to, to what you're saying, oh Lord. So God, unite our hearts, open up our hearts even tonight, oh Lord. As we give you all the glory, as we give you all our affection, as we give you all our adoration, we say, Lord, you're so worthy. You're worthy of that inheritance in this nation, oh God. So we give this time to you. We honor you. We love you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just going to hand this time over to our friends in Mary, uh, Ivan and Trisha and Cornerstone. They will be leading us in a time of, of worship. So yeah, over to you guys.
and tomorrow the same. You will never fade away. You will never change. Lord. Friends, even tonight, I just feel so much the nearness of our Heavenly Father. I don't know if you feel that, but I feel the nearness of our Heavenly Father. He's so near to us. I believe He's near to you wherever you are. And He has such a holy jealousy he has such a holy passion tonight over the generations and maybe some of us some of us may with regards to our fathers or our mothers whether our spiritual fathers or mothers our actual mothers or fathers we've had We've had pain, we've had 
misunderstandings, we have things in the past that have just stolen from us and robbed us of relationships that have broken up relationships whether in our homes, whether in churches you know, I just feel the heart of the Father this evening He sees He knows He, he hears the pain of each of us so, and He feels it too because He has such a holy holy passion, a holy jealousy to see the generations come together Indeed, He has made Himself known as the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. He is the God of generations. And where there has been a tearing apart of fathers and mothers and with their children, oh, there is a, 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 a Father in heaven right now who has a broken heart. Who has a broken heart, just like you and me. We have different things that we have broken us over, but... You know, He's near. He's near to us. He knows. He understands. He sees it. He hears that pain. And, and you know, even in the throne room, I see, I see Jesus. I see the Father. I see this beautiful, unhindered relationship of love. I see how much the Father loves the Son. I see how much the Son honors the Father. I see a son who loves to do the will of the Father. I see a son who loves to honor the Father. And I see this divine pattern even in, in heaven, even right now. We see this loving, un, unhindered love relationship between Father and Son. And even in the same way, He has created us to, be, to, to love and be loved in the same way, even between the generations. So there is such a heartache even when there is that broken, the broken relationship between generations. Oh, but God is just not sitting back, Abba Father. He's not sitting back and allowing the enemy to rob, to steal, to kill, to destroy. Oh, He has a plan and He has a desire. And He will fulfill the desires of His heart. He will fulfill the desires of His heart. And even His Son has made that way for us to be reconciled to the Father and for us even as we turn our hearts to our Heavenly Father there will also be a turning of hearts between us, the fathers and mothers and even the next generation, the children and the turning of the hearts of the children to the fathers and mothers He will accomplish this He will accomplish this and I know generations and the turning of hearts of fathers and mothers to children and children to fathers and mothers. It's been something that we've talked about. But you know, in my heart, in my spirit, I've just been carrying this Malachi 4, 6 words for years. And, but I don't know, it's just in my spirit right now. I just feel that there is a moment in time. Yes, God works in, in time, but there are also moments where it is a Kairos moment. It is a moment where the, the, the voice of heaven, the voice of the Father beckons even louder than before because there is a call, there is a cry in this hour and it is an urgent cry and it requires our hearts to be open. We sang even at the start to open the eyes of our heart and God I'm praying even this evening that we would begin to say we would lay down our guards we would we would we would lay down our pride we would we would lay down whatever it is the walls and God as you bring that healing to us that we're able to even lay aside lay down our guards that we would, hearts will be open not just to the Lord but we'll be open to one another Oh Lord, I'm praying that there'll be such a humility, even as the Lamb Himself displayed such a humility to do the Father's will. I just feel the Father say, would we follow the Lamb? Would we be humble like Him? Would we lay down to hear what the Father is saying in this hour? That we as His children, we would respond rightly. We will posture our hearts, our spirit rightly. Because this is about His desire. It is about His dream, the dream of His heart. And even tonight, that is what we want to do. 
We want to respond to him. We want to respond to him. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I pray that even tonight as we hear from the different generations that our hearts will be so open, our arms will be so open as well. As much as we have been received by our Heavenly Father, we would receive one, one another tonight. So I thank you for this time. I thank you that your presence is so real, so tangible even across this nation. May you be so glorified tonight even as we as we start this 24 hours altar, just focusing on the generations, Lord. Be glorified in our midst. Be, may your name be glorified, be lifted high. Be lifted high, be lifted high across this nation. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. Yes, uh, welcome once again. Welcome to um, the April's MUFW 24-hour uh, prayer altar. And you know, tonight, uh, we just have the uh, a privilege of just having a forum and this forum just to let you know it was pre-recorded on Monday and then we did an editing over it because it was we had so much good content but we could not just fit everything inside so we had to do a bit of editing so we're gonna play this forum right now and um, I'll Pastor Aaron will be sh uh, introducing the members of the forum in this recording as well. So, yeah, just tune in, keep your hearts open as we hear from the panelists, but, we, but more than that, we'll hear from our Heavenly Father. So, tech team, just over to you. Thank you. Welcome to our MUFW forum right now. We're going to have a forum this night, and today on the forum, the topic of the forum is going to be, where is the next generation? Many churches these days, they are in a, in a period of transitioning, right? I know I'm, I come from a church where we are in a period of transitioning. There are movements, there are Bible colleges, there are many leadership roles that are in transition right now. And they are moving <clears throat> from a pioneering generation, the previous generation. Let's call them the pioneering generation, okay? Because mm -hmm. these are the generations that paved the way for us. They're the ones that started churches. They're the ones that started Bible colleges and movements. So let's let's call them the pioneering generation. And they are all transitioning right now to the next generation. So today's discussion is really going to be about where is the next generation that is rising up to take over the leadership roles. On this forum, we have with us Pastor Tio. Pastor Tio is pastoring a Chinese church right now at this very moment. But I'm, I understand that she has pioneered many, many churches, church plant many, many churches, she used to also be the AG Prayer Commission. And right now, she sits on the board with an MUFW core team. Another person representing the pioneering generation is Pastor Raymond Mui. Pastor Raymond Mui leads School of Act. Very famous for moving in the prophetic, moving in signs, wonders, and miracles. And really an evangelist at heart. And representing the next generation will be... Pastor Rachel Bulan. Pastor Rachel Bulan is the pastor for Cornerstone Borneo. And she is also on our MUFW Next Gen core team. Right? We also have Pastor Yuming. Pastor Yuming is the People's Park Baptist Church pastor. And he is also the prayer commission for NECF. And I'm Pastor Aaron. And I'll be moderating today's forum. I'm, I'm a pastor in SIBKL and also together with MUFW Next Gen core. Basically, we've shared with you on the context on where is the next generation, where pioneering generations are transitioning right now and they are looking for the next leaders. During this time of transition, or even before that, you know, the pioneering generation, they, they see and they observe something that is really important. They see a lack of next generation leaders rising up and taking leadership. And we are talking about not just church leadership. We are talking about leadership positions as well, like intercessors, pastors, evangelists, revivalists. These are the roles that are, are being a little bit more vacant right now because of the missing next generation. So, my first question, and I'm going to address it to Pastor Tio. Pastor Tio, I'm going to ask you, in, in your opinion, what are some of the significant historical events or events of the past that has led to the pioneering generation seeing that there is a lack in the next generation that's rising up to take on these leadership roles? All right. Uh, probably just let me share with you about uh, uh, my calling of the pioneer generation. I got saved during the time of a revival. And during the time of the revival, the powerful thing 
that happened in the 70s was a revival of the Holy Spirit. All right, when the Holy Spirit came upon us, we were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And we were called into hours and hours and hours of prayer. Not only that, but there was also a very strong desire to win the loss for evangelism. And so with that calling, baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, that was where I had a heart, a desire uh, to raise the generation during my time in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s. I got saved at the age of 17 uh, from a very staunch Buddhist family. But thank God, because of the Holy Spirit and prayer, my whole family from the temple family came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So after that, when I wanted to go to Bible school, I was beaten and kicked up by my family because it was during a time of persecution. Many of us, and for me, I'm the first generation Christian. And when I went into the village to plant churches of pastoring, and also many of the young people, thank God, the assemblies of God started all right, with a lot of young people. All right, the churches were filled with students. And uh, was we are really wonderful. We filled the whole hall. We rented a small little house, filled up uh, with us 40, 50. And after that, we broke all the walls until no more walls can break anymore. <laughs> then we will move on into another building. Uh, maybe oh, wow. with 70, 100 people, then we broke the wall again. I think we have no more wall to break. All right. <laughs> and so there was such a, a revival among the young people. I still remember, uh, you know, the, the revival, the, the last assembly of God, youth camp, it was so powerful, 800 of us. Wow. And during that time in the 70s, you know, there's no hotel. So we had to go to a school and to have the camp. And the Spirit of the Lord just came upon the people. And they were under the power of the Holy Spirit. And we would pray for hours and hours and hours in the night. Nobody wanted to go and sleep, okay? And next morning, we had to get up 5 o'clock, you know. And, and there was such, such, a, such a wonderful time of, of revival. And it, it was the revival, all right, that happened that gave us the desire to reach the young people, mm. that those are the people that will have to do the work of God. So I took a, a church, all right, 40 people, all young people, students. But then the Lord told me the church is small, but the vision cannot be small. Johor is such a big state. Wherever your feet wanted to go, I will cause you to plant a church. So I received the, the vision from the Holy Spirit. And then I started uh, to train the young people to raise them up, you know, uh, to do a church planting. There were a few things uh, that uh, was very important with the young people. Everyone who came into the church must be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it's a spirit power that will make all of us to be witnesses for Jesus. And then we lock them into the prayer room. We thank God, you know, the early days, I don't know about you all, we grow up, the church was small, all right, but we had a prayer room and the prayer room is very powerful. So all the young people, when they got saved by Form 1, Form 2, Form 3, Form 4, Form 5, they came to the prayer room wow. and uh, they give their money to us to do church planting. You know, they didn't have their lunch, Come right? On. And give the money to us to to, to go through the, our first uh, church was Johor Bahru. There was two hours from Batu Pahat and they, they prayed too. The, during the from Monday, you know, until Friday, they wow. they will be in the prayer room. Like there are so many of them, thirty of them, twenty of them. So I, I could see even even then the signs of revival. All right, the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the prayer. All right, it was given to them, and then of course when they came, they were all first generation Christian, and the parents of persecute them came to the church yeah. with the wood, came to the church with the scissors, came to the church with the songbook and throw around, you know, and all that. But wow. yet. I disciple them. I give them the word of God every week. Give them the word of God so that they could be strong. And they withstood mm -hmm. the persecution. And because they withstood the persecution, today most of their parents are in church, and many of them have been converted. So the church started with young people, and later on with families and families and families. All right. So this was a, a, a the young people, you know. Uh, during my generation, I also cast a vision and say, okay, uh, God must give you a vision for the lost. You are just don't get safe for yourself. Uh, bring your family, but bring other people. So I took them to the streets, you know, with the track, all right, with the track, knock on the door and talk to them about the gospel. And so later on, when we planted our first church in Johor Bahru, they came with me, he tried, you know, and took buses. You know, and they give their money away for us to buy tracks and they, they walk the streets, all right? And later on, we started our first church. And after that, even though it was a church, 
a small little church of 40 people. Every three years, we planted a church. After 20 years, we planted about seven or eight churches. Come on. Now, a few years mm -hmm. ago, I planted the 10 church. I thank God that not only the churches was planted, the Lord released about more than 30 full-time workers, pastors and teachers wow. and evangelists from that little church of 40 young people. So that was mm. my experience of uh, pastoring, church planting and raising uh, the generation. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Theo. You know, just circling back to what you said, you experienced a revival in the 70s that really led to an awakening within yourself and with, within a few people as well that you cried for hours and, and then the calling came and, you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s to go out to the streets to, to just reach out. Do you feel that there is a fervor in the pioneering generation that is very different from the current generation right now? Because what, you, what you've shared with us was, was really the passion and the hunger and a generation that is really sold out for God. So do you feel that there is a change in the fervor or the, or the spiritual hunger for people. Maybe Pastor Tio, you can answer this and maybe we can also get Pastor Raymond to answer this as well. Yes. Yeah. I believe that in the age of a revival, when the Holy Spirit came upon us, it was really very powerful. I remember when the Holy Spirit came upon me during that time, you were baptized with the Holy Spirit. I prayed for many hours a day, at least uh, mm -hmm. from 11 o'clock until 2 o'clock in the morning, at least every day, three to four hours a day. And that was how I learned to uh, pray, all right? Not because my pastor taught me, but because the Holy Spirit taught me. And uh, I, I believe that uh, there was a, such a hunger for God. There's such a, such a hunger for God. But as we begin to look through uh, later on, about 10, 20 years later on, we find that the church it's like a church of Rhodesia. Uh, the Malaysian church became uh, very cold, right? no hunger for God. Uh, we had a lot of uh, program, we have a lot of activities going on, but that desire has been lost. Uh, the seeking mm. God has been lost. And they are not willing to pay the price all right, to serve God. Uh, you know, early days when uh, I told my, my mother that I'm going to Bible school, I was beaten out and kicked out of the family. Oh. But we, we, we were at a point that we said we, we give all to Jesus. We live for Jesus alone under true the persecution. Even my church members, like those people were called into the ministry. They, they were also kicked out by the family, you know, not unwanted. There was one of them, the father was a millionaire. Then he felt that he's called to Bible school. So he, his father said, I will take away all your property. But it, it did not move him. He went to Bible school. We, we had a situation like that, that we were willing to lay down our life. But when we look into the churches today, I think uh, a lot of materialism has come in. The church loved the world so very, very much nowadays. All right, And that is why we are losing the young generation because they are not willing to take up the cross. They are not willing to follow Jesus. They are not willing to suffer. They are not willing to lay down their lives. And I think uh, that may be one of the reasons uh, they have lost the spiritual fervor and uh, mm. the desire to serve God and the desire to lay down their life for the Lord Jesus. All right. Thank you so much, Pastor Theo. Maybe you can hear from Pastor Raymond. Yeah, I, 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 I'm I, very stirred up by what Pastor Theo has been sharing because uh, I was from that era of the 70s mm. revival. I remember ACS. I was there when the ages <laughs> was there with the youth rally, I was there in the, oh, no. in the camp uh, so in Asia oh, cool. from Ipoh. Uh, and uh, that was a time where, you know, you, you just get on your bicycle and go wherever there is uh, something that's happening there that's of the Holy Spirit. And the emphasis of the Holy Spirit was very major. Uh, in everything that was happening there, there was plenty of time to pray in the spirit, to wow. exercise the gift of tongues, and there was the prophetic word all the time. And we really experienced uh, amazing raw presence of God and the manifestation of God's presence. We feel Him, uh, we experience Him, and that created an even greater hunger. Now, when you move forward and see where we are today. It is true that uh, the, the, what is lacking is spiritual hunger. But I must say that uh, just like a taste for a particular, particular kind of food, if you're in an environment that uh, kind of that's what you're surrounded with, that's the, that's the kind of uh, food that is available, I think taste is acquired. 
So the same way with spiritual hunger, I believe that it can be acquired. I think it's about how the generation like where where we are from to recognize that uh, we need to create spiritual hunger. So what it is that we provide as a diet to the present generation is very important. Mm. We have to be very purposeful, very deliberate, that uh, we make sure that if there is something missing, we don't need to get upset about it. We just need to get hungrier for it. We just need to stir up that hunger. So therefore, uh, just like when you have a whole crowd of people in mm-hmm. front of you that are not saved, don't know Jesus, what do you do? You don't, you don't preach about Holy Communion, you preach of salvation, you preach oh. the gospel so yep. that they will receive Christ. So the same thing, if there is a coldness, if there's a lack of revival, what do you preach? You preach revival and you keep preaching revival until people's hearts are revived. So I think you need to, you, we, we need to be passionate about that uh, and we need to be very deliberate. What we have lost is that gap. There, there has been a gap that comes about because there was a lack of spiritual hunger. And I must say in ministry, among ministers, we have been so engaged about uh, building church and aiming for mega churches. We've been so engaged about systems, you know, how we are able to take on and copy whatever it is that the late, that's the latest fad, the latest trend. Mm. And so we, we become so preoccupied with trying to chase the next uh, church and the, mm. or the, the next big success story. And we want to pick that up. We want to oh. implement that and all of that, that we lost the plot that mentoring the next generation, anything that uh, we want to see that's of value, that must advance the plans and the purposes of the kingdom of God that needs advancing can only come about by right leadership, good mm-hmm. leadership, visionary leaders and leaders that would uh, see what is needed in the future that has come today. The future has arrived. And if mm. you can see that, yeah. then uh, there is hope for the for strong, great, better leaders than we have today in the future. And I, I think, of course, which was, I think, squarely the, the vision that we plotted out that uh, my wife and I started the School of X in 1994. And what was it about? It is really about imparting fire, passion, raw desire for evangelism, power evangelism, for souls to be saved, harvest to come in. And how do we do that? And I tell you that, yes, theology has its place, systems, uh, church leadership, all has its place. But I think uh, the lack of passion, there is no fire in your bones and you don't have fuels, revival and feed spiritual hunger. That needs to be stimulated. And so uh, I would say that like Jesus, he he did not disciple uh, beyond 12 uh, Mm. and that you've got 120 and and so forth. So, you know, um, in God's economy, it's never been masses, multitudes, big numbers. Yeah. It's always been who's called by God and you zero in on it and you give yeah. yourself to the select few. And so in the school, just like every year, I, we always put a cap to it. I will not, we will make sure that we do not, of course, in the early years, we learn, we learn from, from experience. So later on, we said to ourselves, we will not have students in each class each year beyond 70, because I think anything more than that, uh, we cannot give ourselves to them the way mm-hmm we would like to produce the kind of product at the end of the school. And so now we have graduates that are serving God in 37 nations around the world out of the Malaysian school. What it is, is that of course, we want to, we want to train up and release world changes. So the next leadership is right within our reach. Wow, thank you so much, Pastor Raymond. I, I, I love what you said about what are we feeding them. Pace is acquired, right? And is because of what we are feeding them. So what we're feeding in the next generation. And that is what is really fueling them. So uh, let's just put a pin on that because I want to come back to this topic. But I, I just want to open up right now to Pastor Rachel and Pastor Yuming as well. Uh, you've heard the pioneering generation mention that, you know, yes, the, their generation had a lot of fervor, had a lot of desire. They were willing to sacrifice. They were willing to pay the price. But they do not see that as much in the next generation. Now, I want to pass the time to Pastor Rachel and Pastor Yuming too. Would you agree with that? Would you disagree with that? Do you want to add on to that as well? I think, uh, you know, the word select few that Pastor Raymond mentioned is very, uh, stood out to me. 
because I don't think we can clump the whole next generation as one group. It's everyone is an individual and each one of them is uh, going through a different journey. So to say that, oh, they're not as fervent as the previous generation, I don't think we can clump them together because there are some who are really fervent and there are some who are just uh, coasting along. Uh, but but I think that the challenge would be, um, at least for me, uh, speaking from my own experience, that when it comes to fervor, uh, the next generation is willing to give up uh, almost anything, I would say, except they draw a line at a uh, family. Because I think there's a lot of past stories from uh, regarding that, where they say ch see children of pastors growing up without their father around, and they get hurt. And so there's a lot of those kind of stories that, that we hear. For my point of view is that we, they are willing to give up uh, anything, but except family. <laughs> That's where they draw the line and say, okay, this one I cannot, I cannot sacrifice my family for the ministry. Uh, so I'm not sure. What, what do you think about that? Do you think that's the right way to approach it? Or uh, do you think this is going against uh, the words of Christ who said, you know, you must give up all uh, to, to come after me? I think you, Meng, just brought up subject about um, does fervency look like sacrificing your children? Does it, does it look like that? Because I'm a pastor's kid, right? My parents um, were kind of absent growing up because mm. at night, you know, they'll have meeting after meeting. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't see dad. Although we live in the same house sometimes for a week, I, I didn't see him at night. You know, in the morning, I, I, I'm going to school at 6.30 and um, I see my mom more. And uh, on holidays, uh, you know, they, they're out for mission trips and things like that. And, and unless I go for mission trips with them, I'll spend a bit more time with them. Uh, of course, um, my story is is very typical, boring, pastor's kid, rebellion. Uh, me and my brothers all, you know, just ran away from church, went into unhealthy activities <laughs> um and but thank the lord he saved us and that's where the holy spirit stepped in there was mm -hmm. something that they couldn't do that only god could do and it was through the intercession and the travailing prayers of mom and dad i can tell you uh, me and my brothers all went through near-death experiences whether it was car crash or uh, drowning uh, from you know drinking too much or overdose from taking too much drugs we were all in in very similar circumstances but mm -hmm. God protected us. And so, you know, we have our family time and we always thank God that he gave us parents who love the Lord, who put him first. In fact, it was their passion for the Lord that um, has been passed down to us, which is our greatest inheritance. And uh, now we understand why he wasn't around at night. Now we understand why um, he had to sacrifice and, and do some things that uh, we couldn't fully understand that. But now we do. Mm -hmm. And we thank God that they did. Um, so allow me just to share, share that. Um, but having said that, you know, I, I really feel like the, the pioneering generation, they were great generals. Mm. I think they were just strong generals. And of course, they were generals because they grew up in an environment where they came out from the World War. I mean, like their great grandparents. My grandfather himself was, was in, the, in the army, you mm. know, um, coming against the, the Japanese. And so um, then, then the boomers arise and they had to uh, fight through uh, poverty and all that. And so yeah. they, they understood kingdom um, as mm -hmm. in a very general uh, attitude that we need to expand the kingdom despite we have family, we have children. Those, those things are not as important as the kingdom of God, right? Which is fantastic. Um, but then now in our generation, um, it, it really is that scripture in 1 Corinthians 4.15, right? For, for though there may be many instructors in Christ, there are not many fathers in Christ. And, and you mm. see that um, now, right, where there are so many generals in the pioneer um, generation that were lacking fathers. And um, in one of my time of intercession, was it two years ago, uh, the Lord just revealed to me, you know, there's a book called God's Generals by yeah. Robert Lydon. You know, I... I consume this book because it's God's generals for revival, for um, reformation, healing evangelists, you know. And, uh, and and he showed me one day, even when I was praying for this, um, that the book turned around. And on the other side of the book, it was God's fathers, God's fathers. And, and, I, and he led me into a time of praying that God will raise up fathers in this generation. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because um, what, that, what the previous generation needed were generals. Exactly what Pastor Teo said, you know, whatever the cost, just go for it, right? But in this generation with, with mental illness and the kind of battles that we fight is no more uh, missiles and cannons and uh, mm -hmm. armies coming against us. The battle is between our two ears. The, the, main, mm. the main battle is here. No more, yeah. not as external as it used to be. And so um, yeah. fathers and mothers are, are now, the calling for fathers and mothers is, is so much more needed 
for this mm. generation. And so you, Meng, I feel like, um, yeah, if, if I can just add on to that very real question for our generation, is it okay to put our family, you know, I, I think the thing was, uh, when I grew up, I think there was this misconception of like, you know, you know how we used to do priority, where yeah, like, yeah. God first, family second, ministry yeah. third, right? What, what if um, God, God is in family, God is in ministry, and they're all at the top? Mm, you know what I mean, yeah. like, um, not to segregate or compartmentalize this work-life balance of mm -hmm. even where yeah. family and ministry need to be. I just yeah. feel like God is not like, you know, those days where you try and do work-life balance. What if it's, mm. it's work-life rhythm? right mm, and, yeah. and it's mm. more a rhythm than it is a balance trying to bring a balance like 50 percent family or <laughs> 70 percent, so it's more godly and then mm. 30 percent ministry and uh and then god is like 100 you know but what if it's a rhythm that yeah, mm, we're supposed to bring our family into our ministry and our ministry into our family and in mm. different seasons of our life you know we would be more into ministry in some seasons we'll be more into family um after all you know the picture of the seesaw like how boring would it be if your seesaw was trying to bring a balance? Like the mm. fun in a seesaw was to bring a rhythm, right? Yeah. That there will be an up and down and an up and a down. And uh, I think that's more beautiful to play than, than, than just a, a balance. But okay, just allow me to just bring one more um, question uh, or a comment about is there fervency and desire for in the next generation? Is there still passion or is it lacking? Okay. Uh, that's a really good question <laughs> because uh, where where I'm at, I think um, with I can only speak in Cornerstone Borneo. Um, we've had to turn down a few young people who wanted to come into full time ministry. You know, wow. the only thing we're lacking is um, finance. I can't I can't afford them, <laughs> and so I would rather them work and then they come and serve the church for free. Praise the Lord. <laughs> no, just kidding. But <laughs> um, at, at the same time, I think uh, what's lacking is. I mean, how do you start a fire, right? Uh, in science, they tell you you need you need three elements, isn't it? You need the fuel, um, you need the oxygen, and you need heat, right? Mm -hmm. And if I can say the oxygen is like the Holy Spirit, it, it, which which comes through the, the prayer and intercession and, and speaking in tongues, like exactly like what Pastor Theo and Pastor Raymond are saying, that's how it, it started. So prayer, like activated through a lot of prayer. And if we have prayer rooms in our churches that is alive, I, I feel like you have no problem. Lah, all right. Mm -hmm. Thing is um, fuel, right? Which is like fuel can be wood, it can be paper. So in this instance, I would say it's community of believers, community of believers who are in the word of God and, and constantly engaging in the word of God. But the, the one thing that I feel we are lacking is the heat, the fire, the, the fire starter. Um, how yeah. many fire starters do we have in our churches? And are our pastors on fire? You know, I, I always think that uh, if your pastor is on fire, you can, you can only do two things, right? You either fire the pastor or you catch on fire yourself, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, and it's just that's the thing, like how many of our pastors are on fire? Because if our pulpit is not on fire, obviously your people are not on fire too, right? And I feel like they, we have so many churches that are the Church of Sardis, like the Church of Laodicea, um, like the Church of Ephesus, right? We, we've got things mm. going. We're so involved in building a big church. We forgot that we need to build big people. Like, that, like yeah. to build big people is such a huge part on God's heart. But um, let's go back. What are we, what, what is coming out from our pulpits? Is there fire coming out from our pulpit? Or are we still teaching things just on, just on how to build the church? I think, mm. I think that's why like the desire and the calling for revival is a consistent theme and topic in this generation. It, it's, it's very real, right? And so I, I feel like the question could be, do young people have the capacity to be on fire? I think yes. I mm. think we do have the capacity. Uh, we do have the desire to be on fire. Then the question is, what are we feeding from our pulpit? I don't want to put blame on which generation or what generation or who, but is the question falling on young people or is it on the leadership or is it on us? What are we feeding our people? Yeah, we need fire starters, amen. I just feel like yeah, that's, yeah. that's it, fire starters. We have the, we have the, fuel, we have the oxygen, we have the fuel, do we have the fire? Hey, can so I good. share something? Yes, can please I go ahead. Yeah, the older generation, 
I think we have faith. We yeah. have faith. We yeah. live by faith. All right. When when we start pioneering, at first, when I was in second year Bible school, when I pioneer, the church only gave me 70 ringgit. Mm. I'm surprised how I survived all these years. Okay. So when I came to Batu Pahat, being yeah. about 40 young people, I was given a bicycle. I was given a church at the, with a room. All right, the front was a hall uh, for meeting, and I was given two hundred ringgit to, to 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 survive. All right, and the church only give me two hundred ringgit. Yeah. All right, and then we just we just trust God, and with the two hundred ringgit, we have to pay our tithes. We have to give our mission, and by the end, we only survive on fifty ringgit or seventy ringgit a month. You know, for a long, long time, when the people came to church and they give the offering is. 50 cents, uh, 10 cents, 20 cents. And, and and that's all we had in our offering bag, you know. I, re- I, I don't remember. I've seen one dollar. <laughs> I still oh. remember one day, somebody went out to work, you know, and he, he tied with a dollar. And I remember I took the one dollar, I took the money and I with tears, I nailed down by the bed. And I said, Lord, this one dollar, can it grow into... Hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, and millions. And you mm. know, later on, we planted the churches. We bought buildings by the millions. Many of the uh-huh. churches, they bought so their good. own building by the millions. And the Lord sent me to 34 nations of the world. Come on. All right. Wow, so good. 34 nations of the world because of the intercession for the nations. And those money came in. I don't have the money to travel. And I saw the Lord is faithful. Because we live by faith. I, 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 I'm amazed by the great goodness of God that one dollar grew mm. into millions of dollars. That's and a really good point. Yeah. Planting to the different nations of the world. And so, so I think, uh, I don't know whether the young people know how to live by faith and really yeah. trust God and go out there and say, God, you are great. You are wonderful. You are a provider. Yeah. The, my next question really is like, where has that faith gone? But Mimi, I'd just like to share a bit of my story as well. You okay. know, um, I'm a third generation Christian. My great, my grandfather was a missionary. My father recently just told me that he also had a calling, but he did not follow the calling. Now me, you know, and and my father growing up as a missionary son, you know, it was a there was a lot of lack in the in the family. You know, there's a lot of uh, they were they were given rations instead of wages. You know, so it was really tough on the family. And because of that, my father knew that lack. He was still very fervent. He was still very dedicated to God. He gave his life to God. He was one of the, he is one of the pioneers in my, in my home church in Penang. He still gave his all for God. But one thing I felt that was a bit lacking was the encouragement given to me because I knew I had a calling when I, when I was a, at a very young age, but there wasn't much encouragement for me to go full time. Because mm. there was because of the lack that he felt, he did not want me to have that same lack for myself or for my family. Mm. You know, and I'll, and and that became a real struggle in my life because growing from a family that doesn't have much, you know, once you start to get a little bit more things, you tend to hoard things then, and you you don't want to lose those things. And those yeah. things like materialism, particular, you talk about materialism, you know, it, it became so real in my life. And after a while, but God really convicted me of it, and. And surprisingly enough, one of the main confirmations that I got to go full time was actually from my father. My father one day just took up his took out and said, "Hey, son, do you want your grandfather's Bible?" And I was like, "Sure, why not?" He gave me the Bible. I opened the Bible, and the Bible said, "This is a gift from R. Roberts." I look at the Bible. I look at my mm. father. What What is this? What is this? I don't understand. He said, "Oh, did I tell you your your grandfather was saved during R. Roberts R. Roberts ministry cool. and one so of his cool. disciples?" I was like, what? No way. You know, and <laughs> God totally broke my whole entire paradigm. Uh, because growing up from a family that's uh, that don't have don't have a lot, you know, I always wanted to be able to supply everything for my family in the future, you know. Mm-hmm. At least next time, if they have a full-time calling, they don't have to struggle, at least pay down payment for house, get second hand car, something like that, right? Leave something for them so that they can set them up for success. Right. But at that point of time, God just spoke to me. And God just told me, hey, Aaron, do you want to leave behind an inheritance of wealth or do you want to leave behind a spiritual inheritance for your children? Mm. And that was it. That was it. And from then on, I, I'm totally sold. You know, I, I, I left my corporate job. I went in full time. So when we, we talk about that faith, right? 
I see a few elements here. You know, Pastor Teo, Pastor Raymond, Rachel, um, you all of you spoke of a power encounter that came. Mm. From, from that power encounter, there's such a conviction that comes as well. And it leads and it, it, it drives people. There's a fire within it. And also, Pastor Yuming, you talk about that balance, you know, having that balance between the family and uh, not, not wanting to give up family out. out. For me, I'll add one more thing, which is the comfort and the finances as well. You know, our generation maybe we grew up with a bit more comfort than <laughs> the previous generation, right? Mm -hmm. And some of us are not willing to to give that up. And I also want to bring in what uh, Pastor Rachel said about how do we start a fire, or oxygen, fuel, and the heat. Where the oxygen is the Holy Spirit, the fuel is the community, and the heat. Now the heat is the fire, right? Is what's what's being taught on the pulpit. You know, or the faith that's being mentioned by Pastor Teo and Pastor Raymond. So the thing is, where is that faith right now? Where right. is the pulpit teaching? Where what are we teaching in our church right now? So this leads me to my next question. What is the spiritual condition of our churches right now as compared to the past? Where are we right now? What are we teaching on our pulpit that is not causing the next generation to have that spark, to feel that fire, to keep them burning. You know, where what is the spiritual condition of this church? I'm gonna I'm gonna open this to every single one of you here. If anybody feels led to just share their thoughts on this, please feel free to. Well, I uh, probably I'll I'll just quickly uh, speak out here. Um, you know, uh, of course, uh, when it comes to uh, faith life, we. We can go to the Word of God and it tells us everything. But in truth, I, I think today's generation uh, is very fast to um, detect the fake from the real. Uh, and so, you know, because we have been uh, kind of so exposed to, you know, uh, those uh, negative reports and, you know, you've got exposure of uh, you know, flaws and, and, and wrongs mm. and basically sins from uh, senior ministers and all of that with regards to uh, issues of uh, financial integrity and uh, you know abusing whatever it is that kind of like you have a fake right. front and you know real at the back really at the back of you is just nothing but lust for money love of money right. hoarding and all of that so sometimes this has uh, kind of cost uh, people just kind of think this generation would think that hey, it really is not true. It doesn't work mm. or what have you. Yeah. So it brings back again the balance, like uh, what our brother Yuming asked the question, and it's very real. That you know, instead of being in the past where you got this militant uh, approach uh, that it slams right down on you, that this generation will not accept it anymore. Mm. So you, uh, you know, I, I, I. I do it because I, I, this is what I am, this is who I am, or whatever. That's that's long gone. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's back to the balance of again, uh, the church and leadership needs to go back to themselves. You know, just like I always say that you cannot bring someone where you've not yeah. been yourself. You cannot yeah. yep. give what you yourself do not possess. So yeah. if you give something that you don't have, you're actually faking it. Um, you you're actually pretending uh, to be a pretender so you know it's just like uh, today the church as we know the center of any church is always around an altar an altar is what you need mm -hmm. and if you don't have an altar but you have a stage then you have performers yeah and good mm. and oh, so good. we have so many performers yeah uh, and so few that are true priests it's because we've take away, taken away the altars from the church. Yeah. Mm. We can instead put a stage there and do mm. the presentations. So the people that are up there, if they are, they are just on the stage, then they are performers. And right. So mm. we really need to get back and how do we call the present leadership to get back to a place of being truthful. Come on. Uh, and living and learning to live the life of faith. And so um, I, I call that all the time. And as an evangelist, I will tell you that for a long time, if you are nothing but an evangelist, you starve to death and your children will die with you in hunger <laughs> because there's not enough coming in for an itinerant evangelist. That's right. Uh, so I'm speaking out of experience. I know that very well. 
And that was not, and that's not the reason why uh, I started a church. I started a church because God told me to. I actually started a church 10 years after I started School of Acts. Right. So, uh, but the idea is that I would tell you that just as I said, the people that comes through to the school, I take it as this is what I'm doing, preparing the next generation of leaders, preparing the next generation of evangelists. So my wife and I live this out with them. My church, my ministry, School of Acts does not buy my petrol, does not pay for my car, does not buy my, my provisions or my house. I totally live by faith. Mm. Mm. I will tell you, it transforms lives. When we walk that way, mm. when they see the truth, when they live with me for, and walk with me for all of those six months, it switches. The life of faith and the message of faith is not just, it cannot be taught in, in, in a class. It must be exercised. Mm. We've got to get people to exercise faith life. It's oh, just so like... Good faith is developed and if we mm. can be true spiritual fathers and mothers to them and says let's carry it together so wow. uh, i think there's no shortcuts i do believe that it requires this generation of leaders to pay the price in order to, mm. get, to get them to become strong in faith so good thank you we are slightly running out of time right now so i'm going to go to our very last question and it's a much needed question which is going to be open for everybody as well mm. for the pioneering generation as well as the next generation and this question is what is needed to raise the next generation pastor Tio, maybe you can start first okay first of all i think just as pastor raymond say i think we must have an encounter with god all right we had an encounter with god through the revival i think god must be something that is very very real all right and uh, because of the encounter with god and the revival our life with god uh, is sustained uh, to prayer i think that's something that's very important we continue on have such a hunger and desire for god uh, because uh I, I remember i prayed three three hours a day and after that, you know, a whole day will be reading the Bible, such a hunger to read the Bible, or do evangelism and all that. So that encounter with God uh, is something that's very powerful. And so I, I pray that we will know how to bring uh, the, the, the young people into an encounter with God. There will be a lot of changing. Uh. And then the second one that I can talk about is the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh. Uh, because when we do evangelism, many times, as Pastor Raymond said, you know, move powerfully. Uh, some of them, they have cancer, they cannot be healed. They came in, they got all kinds of sicknesses. We lay hand and pray for them. And they were healed by the power of the Holy Spirit. But it is the Spirit of God that gives them such a heart, a heart's desire, you know, to, to reach out uh, for the lost, uh, for the souls. I, I think the young people must have such a desire to win the loss, all right? But when, when Jesus is so real to you in your life, you want the whole world to know about him, all right? It's true. I think we have to keep that passion for God mm. in our in our life. I, I feel yeah. that I've been in the ministry. This is my 50th year in the ministry, all right? Oh, <laughs> wow. Uh, all right. Uh, you know, I think it has to be the passion that you keep for Jesus, you know, a uh, hunger and a desire for him early in the morning, pray and and stay in God's presence and intimacy. Because in the intimacy, Jesus said, abide in me, and, and then you will bear for fruits. The young people must have passion for God because as you in the ministry, you serve God, you go through all kinds of problems, all kinds of temptation, all kinds of situations. Sometimes you're molded, sometimes you're broken, you know, and sometimes you go to death and situations, sicknesses and all that. But it is the, the, your, your encounter and your, your life with God that will sustain you out whatever circumstances situation you have uh, also uh, vision all right casting the vision take them on a job training casting mm -hmm. the vision and also discipleship all right uh, that will continue uh, to help them to move on uh, but i believe that the faith uh, faith element is very 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 strong because uh, uh, the faith you know still you we have to trust god uh, for everything all right you know, so uh, I think these are the few things I felt that if we want to raise the young people, uh, I think we have to do that. All right. That was my generation. I don't know this generation. Maybe most of you have uh, more situation uh, that you can share about. Pastor Raymond, how, how about for yourself? What is needed to raise the next generation? I think one is that uh, the leaders today must catch 
this sense of urgency. Mm. That, uh, the future has already arrived and we don't have any more time. Uh, we have to redeem time about raising up the next generation. So everything that we do as in the name of ministry, whether it is in teaching or preaching or what have you, it has to be with a view of duplicating yourself. So uh, we have to look at uh, how we've done it. We have to do a post-mortem. Are we contributing to uh, raising up the next generation? I think it has to be very purposeful. Just like we always say leaders are not born, but they, they have to be raised and so forth. So I think it is uh, something that we have to focus in on and be very deliberate. And then, of course, uh, if in order for us to do that, then we have to uh, make some very radical changes to have a new set of priorities. Therefore, uh, it requires for us even to slow down. I always say that there is that period of time in a year where I have to slow down or basically not even do any miracle rallies or evangelistic rallies because I'm, not, uh, I'm no longer uh, doing the adding into the kingdom, I'm multiplying. So I'm multiplying by how many more people I'm able to raise in part uh, and pray that anointing on them so that uh, more will be doing the same works and there will be a multiplication factor into the kingdom of God. So uh, it has to be strategic in that way that it gets you to have to reassess how things are being done, come bringing alongside people that matters to you, that you know that there's something about them, there's a potential in them that you will become a leader. And having said uh, about leadership today, we must also recognize that it is not like in our era where, you know, it is just about the spiritual things, the word of God and so forth. People are looking at how, because leadership is about impact and influence. And so uh, they, are, they are in the marketplace, they are in the professional field, and they, they as leaders representing the Lord Jesus Christ, they are to be impactful with what they do, and that way they are leaders for the kingdom of God, and they must be a people of influence. Taking from uh, Numbers chapter 13, uh, when you see the 12 spies, you realize that the the 10 spies, we, we, we throw stones at them, but these 10 spies were very powerful influences. They influenced a whole nation not to move forward. Mm. And a whole yeah. nation stayed back because of mm. uh, bad influence. So influence is important, but are, they, are we raising up people that will render good influence or bad influence? And just like reminding you that the 10 of them had bad influence, it uh, destroyed the whole generation, a right. whole people group. So mm -hmm. I think that it's important for us to zero in on that influence. Are we raising up influencers? Uh, mm -hmm. Because that's leadership, in, mm -hmm. whether it's marketplace or in the professional field or in the work of the ministry. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. So good. Thank you so much, Pastor Raymond. You may, why don't we hear from you what is needed to raise the next generation, or as a next generation representative, mm. what do we need from the pioneering generation to raise mm. us up? I think coming back to uh, the scriptures, right? If there's anyone who represents the next generation, it will be um, Timothy. And the thing we read about Timothy, uh, it says that he had a mother and a grandmother who were of the faith, uh, but it doesn't have a mention anything about his father. And I think that's where the Apostle Paul stepped in to become his spiritual father. Uh, the point, yeah. 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 And so, so I good. think that set a pattern where uh, the Apostle Paul really discipled him and the two letters to Timothy are probably a very good guideline, I'll, I'll say, to raise up the next generation. Is putting that into practice, uh, how he he was, uh, he showed Timothy the struggles he went through. He showed Timothy, um, all invited Timothy into his life and gave him advice uh, like how a father would to a son. Uh, so we need that. I think one of the things that really impacted me in my early years of pastoring uh, was this, uh, I think it was by Dream Malaysia, they had this fathering initiative where they just gathered all the young pastors and a group of pioneering pastors together for a three-day camp. Uh, and then they just did it like that, three days with these uh, pioneering pastors. But but it was so impactful. Up to today, I I, I, I treasure those uh, moments because it really put something in my spirit that helped me to to persevere through the difficult years of uh, pastoring. 
So yeah, fathering mm -hmm. initiatives and uh, a father's heart for the next generation is uh, so, so needed. Uh. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I think Pastor Teo and Pastor Raymond had put in good structure, uh, good thoughts. I feel like they have, um, the principles remain, although methods may change. I, I think I'll just come on one angle. Um, if we can overcome um, the misconception between the generations, I think we can move together as one. Mm. Even if there was good systems in place to hand over, for example, but if the misconceptions maintain, we cannot move together as one. Because what I'm hearing um, many a times from the older generation is that, uh, yeah, there are a lot of young people, but they're just not ready. You know, they're not ready. They're immature. They haven't uh, eaten enough salt or they haven't gone through the hard stuff. Um, you know, they're the strawberry generation. They're uh, too emotional, you know. But there's also a misconception from the older gen, uh, from the younger gen who, who think that the older gen don't trust us. Right. Mm. Yeah. And, and I guess it is true in a sense that um, they give us places to lead because actually they have no choice, lah, you know, so uh, we're running out of leaders. So they put up the millennials. Right. But um, okay. even in then they, they put them up. But when we don't feel like they trust us because of when we make mistakes, sometimes the mistakes is seen as like, oh, you have put the whole church in danger. You know, there's not enough room um, to make mistakes sometimes. Uh, so that's why the younger gen always feel like that the older gen doesn't trust, that the pioneering generation doesn't trust us. I can say as a young senior pastor, a lead pastor of a church, um, I'm in a disposition where being the lead pastor or the senior pastor of the church, I, I, I understand both sides. I understand where it takes a lot of risk to put young people in places of leadership, right? And sometimes it does feel like this young person is going to just break everything that you have started. Like the fear of they're going to ruin everything that you started. What took me 10 years, you just ruined in one month, you know, and it's just like, oh no. And you're, you're like always taking risks with these young people. And you're always thinking like, are they going through it well? Are they going through it right? And so my mistake would be to try and like over, over manage them. Micromanage. Micromanage them. And, uh, and stifle them. And then I realized, you know, uh, God gave me the grace. Like, how many times has he been patient to me? I started out at 27 years old when we planted Cornerstone 10 years ago. Mm. And man, did I make a lot of mistakes. You know, thank God they were not grievous mistakes or sinful mistakes. They were just mistakes here, mistakes there, shout too loud, you know, stamp your feet too loud. <laughs> Uh, too passionate, too fiery, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's a season I preached about revival for like three months or something. <laughs> Everybody became barbecue after that. <laughs> I figured we're going to talk about family. And, uh, let's talk about family sometimes. <laughs> but um, there were some mistakes I made and then the father was so patient with me and, and he said to me, if I can be patient with you, why can't you be patient with the next gen, right? Mm. With, with the next tier of leaders coming up. Um, and so... I think uh, we need to overcome these misconceptions. Uh, if we can overcome them, we can then move forward together. Whereas the young people must understand, um, it, it, there's a huge risk that the leaders have taken to, to give you that platform. And mm -hmm. because of that, there must be a measure of honor mm -hmm. and yeah. reverence of the platform because yeah. when the leaders gave you that platform, it's not because they want things to be perfect or things to look good. They just want to glorify God. Like, that's what we desire is to glorify God. And we work so hard for this platform to, to come to where it is. And so when we hand it over, we desire that the next year um, would handle it and carry it with reverence. Not because yeah. they are afraid of us or failure, but just because the Lord deserves our best. You know, and, um, and as for the older generation, I feel like we, we have to overcome the fear of our, of our platform being ruined, you know, that if God can take care of us when we were younger, surely he will, he, it is his church, right? Amen. He will surely take care of the next generation who um, we have entrusted with. And I, I feel like when we entrust the next generation with leadership, with responsibilities, we need to be able to let them make mistakes, giving them room to make mistakes. Now, that doesn't mean let them go completely, because that's not true discipleship. But what it means is that uh, we would hear them out rather than immediately cut them off. Um, that looks like uh, giving them space 
to verbalize their thoughts and intent rather than immediately imposing our thoughts and intent. Um, that means when they make mistakes, it shouldn't be seen as grievous in a way that uh, we boycott them or we cancel them. You know, uh, generals have this tendency to cancel people who don't live up to their standard, you know. Um, and that's, that's a very general uh, thing, like, leaders who are generals for a generation i understand that making mistakes there was no not much room because you didn't have enough resources to make many many mistakes and so when mistakes are made it's it's almost like i'm never going to put you there again and i think that's the problem right when we make that kind of decision in our hearts or in our mind when the, when the next generation makes some mistakes we say i'll never put you there again i think um that's where the next gen always feel like gosh I will never live up to your standards. You know, uh, they can never reach up to our standards. Um, yeah, so just I just want to simply put it as more as a more of, of a posture because I think discipleship programs, systems, all these are very very good in terms of handing over a ministry to the next generation. But is our culture, is our mindset flexible enough to be able to hand over to the next gen? Yeah. So just to sum it up, uh, what is needed to raise the next generation? What I can see are uh, there are three major parts to it. One is the fundamentals. Now, Pastor Tio talk about the fundamentals. You need your spiritual disciplines. You need mm. prayer. You need the word of God. You need an encounter with God. You need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. You must have passion for God. At the same time, discipleship is also important. Where discipleship, the one discipling needs to cast the vision give OJT, you know, and really draw their full potential. Then after that, we, from Pastor Raymond, I heard, you know, we still need the generals. We still need the generals that are in there. There has to be a sense of urgency in the generals to raise up the younger ones right now. The generals now need to make a call to a point where they must make radical changes in priorities. This is what Pastor Raymond said, the radical changes in priority. He also talked about passing on of the anointing empowering and allowing people to give platform you said that there are seasons of time where you know you cannot do many things anymore right but instead it's, it's time to disciple so and and part of disciple i believe is really passing on the anointing and really empowering people to take on the platforms as well and then from you Ming and pastor rachel really what i hear from the next generation even for myself even is that the cry for fathers and mothers you know, mm. we need the fathers and mothers to come in. We need the father's heart. We need the father's initiative. You know, we need we need the fathers to really come to the table right now together with their sons and daughters and trash things out. You know, let's let's put away all the misconceptions. Right. Let's put away all this all the stereotype right now. And right. let's really hear the hearts of the fathers and of the children and, and being and, and let's see Malachi 4 coming in coming to fruition, coming to the reality, right? We need the fathers to be able to hey. Let us ride a bike and fall. You know, a chance to fail and a chance to make mistakes. Uh, but at the same time, us as the next generation, we need to look and honor our yes. fathers and mothers. Yeah. You know, when they give us a platform, that platform is not to be trifled with. That platform is not to be taken lightly. It's sure. to be taken with reverence. You know, mm. every single platform may be a pulpit, may be a leadership role. It has to be taken with seriousness. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's one more thing is to overcome the fear of the platform being ruined. Wow, this one, this one is huge, and and, and this is this is truly something that I, I believe God needs to work in each yeah. and every one of us as the as the fathers and mothers that are passing on to the to the next generation. I believe God needs to work in them, and as we receive these platforms, as we receive this ministry. God needs to work in us as well because as we take on these ministries, we take on these platforms, you know, it's it's very natural that we want to have a little twist, make it our own. But we have to all, all of us, all generations need to remember that all ministries, all movement, all churches belongs to God. Yeah, it's good. Whether he, yeah, whether he want to bring it further, whether he says, yeah, this is it for now, the chapter's closed, it is all on him. Mm. And I just want to, I want, I just want to rewind back a little bit to to the beginning where is the next generation right we talked about you know pastor rachel you mentioned that you have so many young people looking to come into the church you just don't have enough funds or you don't have enough platforms you know so i think this is a precursor or this is evidence that 
there is spiritual hunger in the next generation. Yeah. The next generation is really, really hungry for God, really hungry for the word yeah. of God. And they are hungry for an encounter mm. with God. Right. But will we give them that platform? Now, mm. will we give them that opportunity right now? So representing the next generation, I think I, I speak on, on behalf of Yuming and Rachel as well. The next generation is here. We are here. Yes. We are willing to rise up. We are willing to right. take on and we are willing to honor our fathers and mothers, you know. Right. And we, what we are saying is that, you know, do continue to lead the way. Yeah. You know, do continue to lead the way. We want to walk beside you so that you can bring us and disciple us and we want to hear from you we, God, because you are, you are that Moses. You have all the experience, all the anointing, all the knowledge and we want to gleam from that. But yeah. we are the Joshua's. We have that strength. We have that courage. We can go into battle. Mm. So we partner together right now, you know, and, and just really seeing God's kingdom and Malachi fall coming to pass. You know, so with this, we want to end the forum. Uh, and our and the way we want to end the forum is we we are the next generation MUFW next gen. We're gonna be we we'll we we will be anchoring slots, and we want to invite more next generation people to come yeah. on board with us Excellent. so if you are a next generation and you are listening to this right. forum we want to invite you to come alongside us together with our fathers and mothers in anchoring the mufw anchoring this national altar anchoring this movement and this call that god has for malaysia and yeah. i'll pass the time now to pastor staff who will give us the details on that thank you very much can you guys just join me in just thanking um, the panel? That was such a, such a good discussion, wasn't it? Uh, there was just so many uh, things that were raised up, and I think actually this conversation can really go on into you know, even a few parts. And you know, actually my heart is that this is not a once-off moment that we are talking about the generations, but it is just a moment where we are opening up um, this, our hearts to one another to say, let us continue this conversation uh, in our homes, in our churches, and, and let's see how the Lord brings us uh, from this point. And you know, as Pastor Aaron was sharing, I'm just here representing the MUFW Next Gen uh, team. And actually with me, uh, I don't know if they can turn on their videos, but if they can, they can just turn on their videos and wave hi. Uh, I'm not here alone. I'm here with a, a group of people that I would want to consider family. And we are not here just to do something else. You know, some of the questions that we've asked ourselves is, are we just doing something else? Are we just repeating this cycle that we seem to go into? We are, and, 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 you know, just replicating something that's, that we've seen in the past. But I, in my heart, I really believe this is not just going to be one of those. But... Uh, we're really here as the next generation and as the generation to respond to a call of God in this time. Yeah, it is a call of God. And I do believe that part of this journey would look like holding a tension. You know, we talk a lot about the different misconceptions. We talk about, you know, it's so beautiful. Each generation has such a heritage, such a journey that is uh, unique to their generation. We will never understand what it's like to have 200 ringgit only right we would never understand that but we are not required to 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 understand that perhaps but like pastor rachel was saying you know the the battle is between our two ears but that is something the pre, the pioneer generation may not understand as much so you know each generation has a unique call and something unique that we are required to overcome and if we can open our hearts to see that that every generation has uh, something that is given to them to overcome and to pass on, then we would see the beauty in the generations coming together. Amen. And so uh, I'm just saying even tonight, it is really not about having answers per se. It is about holding a tension that we have that, yes, sometimes you're not going to agree. Sometimes you're going to feel the fear of handing over a platform. Sometimes you're going to see mistakes happen, but the question is how are we going to respond in the midst of it? Are we going to close our hearts to one another? Or are we going to allow the Lord to turn our hearts to one another? As Pastor Aaron said, it, and I feel so strongly, this is a Malachi 4-6 moment. 
It is that moment that comes before the return of the Lord. There has to be a turning of the hearts of fathers to their children and the children to their fathers. And, and so, yeah, that, I'm also going to make this a call to the next generation. If you're here or if you know next generation in your midst, uh, drop a message or just drop us an email uh, on our social media, whatever it is, connect with us. We want to bring even the generations together to continue this conversation. We want to bring the next gen together to steward what the Lord has uh, on this platform together with our fathers and mothers in, 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 in this nation. Amen. And so, Lord, I'm just, I'm just so thankful. I'm so thankful that you're a father. That God, you've called us your sons and your daughters. And it's, you know, it's always been relational for you. It's always been about love for you. And so even beyond what we do, um, our ministries, beyond even the, the prayer altars that we de desire to establish, and we know that it's on your heart. But while we're doing that, could help us hold this tension between the generations. Open up lines of communication. Turn our hearts one to another again. Give us the spirit of Elijah, O oh God, even in this hour. That we're not just connected uh, vertically like a ladder, but we will become bridges one generation to another. Indeed, like the Psalms say, it will be that we will commend your works one generation to another. We would, we would be those that would stand in the gap to say, no, we will not allow the breaking apart of the generations. We will take a stand in this place, even as the watchmen on the wall in this nation saying, God, we will fulfill the desire of our hearts, not just in prayer, but in our very lives, that we would say that we become the bridge of intercession between the generations. So God, I'm asking Lord, even in, in this hour, give us the spirit of Elijah, release it so powerfully in this nation, oh God. Give us the humility, oh Lord, to see beyond what we can only see from only our own understanding, but open up our eyes to see the way that you see Abba Father. You see so beautifully, you created so beautifully every generation, unique, fearfully and wonderfully made. So God, we thank you. We trust you in this process. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. God, we continue to ask of you to put before us, Lord, the joy that is set before Jesus. The joy that, that Jesus set uh, before him to endure the cross. God, we just asking even right now, looking to Jesus as generations of Malaysia. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the price of the generation before us, that the, the price that they have paid, the pathway they have paid for us, um, that to, that we can enjoy where we are. But yet, God, I pray that, Lord, that you release understanding upon the hearts of the generations. You will need our hearts together. God, I'm asking just as Jesus, for the joy set before him, endure the cross, that, Lord, there will be joy in us, Lord, to endure the process of becoming like one. That, Lord, the covenant, that, 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 that the enduring of the cross is to bring forth a oneness that, that has been set before uh, the ages, before ages, Lord, where you say that you made us in your image, created in your likeness. There is a capacity in us to long for that oneness among the generations. The way, Lord, that how Pastor Steph prayed at the beginning, Lord, about that honor that the Father gives to the Son gives to the Father, and the Father gives to that to the Son, and the inworking of the Holy Spirit, that, that triad trinity, that, that unity that's working among them. God, we're asking for that to be released upon us. God, we say, Lord, set a fresh understanding of covenantal relationship between the generations. God, we're not just after a covenant relationship between us and you, but the covenantal relationship is leading us, uh, that great and first commandment must release us into the new commandment that will effect a change in the way we relate to one another. God, we need that, Lord, that, that, that fresh understanding of a covenantal relationship with you leading to a covenantal relationship with one another. That, 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 that the way you say it is in the new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. God, you set the bar for us. You have shown us the way. God, I pray that you will release the grace upon each and every one of us. God, we are in need of that grace. God, you say, blessed are the poor in spirit. God, we are asking right now that, Lord, we will recognize the poverty in our hearts, Lord, that we are in need of you. Not just 
as a next generation, but Lord, for every one of us, every generation, we have a greater need of you than we would actually realize. And so Holy Spirit, bring forth a fresh understanding, a fresh conviction of us coming back to that first and great commandment leading to the new commandment that our, as our hearts are united, there will be an unleash of a great commission movement leading to the end time harvest. So Lord, this is our cry to you tonight, Lord. This is our cry to you, Lord. Do a deeper work. Do the work that only you can do, Holy Spirit. Bring forth that fresh understanding, a deep desire and longing for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Raymond, is are you able to pray, Pastor Raymond, all the way from yeah. Taiwan? Yeah. Okay, yes, Pastor. yes. Hallelujah. Father, we just want to thank you today that uh, this is the time that is appointed of God. And Amen. we as the church in Malaysia, we stand together shoulder to shoulder with each other because we know, Lord, that you've needed us together and the destiny, the spiritual destiny of a nation is in our hands as you have entrusted this nation to us. And so, God, more than we just praying, God, we pray that our thoughts and all the meditation of our hearts, Lord, with regards to ministry, the work of God, will always be that which is you who has purpose for us, that we will serve the Lord for a nation. I pray in Jesus' name that as you are the God of generational blessing, that Lord, you have appointed that there will be one generation to the next. And so we pray that Lord, you will give us grace, grant us great grace, that God, every one of us will be gracious. Lord, will move in that spirit of grace, that Lord, we will always be one that will render, that will give, that will share, that will encourage, that will bless one another, the next generation. Lord, we thank you that in the end times, you have said that, Lord, in this day, Lord, you will cause your people to be willing and that, Lord, you will, we will see the newness, the renewal of youthfulness for every work of the ministry, that it will be just like the strength of the youth returning back to the next generation from passing on of this generation. Lord, we thank you and praise you, Lord, because what we hand down will not be weak. What we hand down will not be substandard. What we hand down will be of quality, will be of substance. Lord, that we whatsoever we hand down will be so that God, it will be more than enough for them to build upon. And we thank you that, Lord, as the generations passes, Lord, we thank you and praise you, Lord. You have said that God, your 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 plans and the kingdom of God's principle is always, always yet greater works will they do. So God, we speak this into the coming generation. We speak this into the present generation that is rising up, Lord. Greater works they will do. Greater works, Lord, that they will see manifest in everything that they do. Fruitfulness like we have never seen before. Lord, the nation needs revival. Your people needs revival. The church needs revival. And so, God, we pray, let the latter rain be greater than the former. Let the latter house be greater than the former. You've spoken it. We pray that, God, you will bring it to pass, that our eyes will be able to see and behold the glory of God. We pray in Jesus' name, Lord, let the heart beat, Lord, that you put upon us, Lord. Let this beat beat let that heart beat over every place everywhere all throughout the nation it will be the same beat lord the same beat of excitement lord that the next is going to be greater lord it's going to be higher that's going to be an acceleration lord i pray let our heart beat the same lord so that our faith will be connected to it lord that as we believe so shall it be. As we believe, it shall come to pass. Oh, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that as all that you have done, God, as all that we have received, Lord, we've received it from a generation past. So it shall be also, God, that this is our inheritance, Lord. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, that we will see a great and a mighty move, Lord, and it will be one of a movement, Lord, a movement that will move from the north to the south, from the east to the west, 
a movement that is of God by the Spirit of God, anointed powerfully by the Holy Spirit, a movement, Lord, that will saturate the land and will bring healing to the land and will bring salvation to the lost. God, let that be a mighty movement of young people, Lord, a movement, Lord, that will cause every space, every place, Lord, that will be, it will be taken, Lord, no gaps, no missing parts, Lord, but God, you will bring a completion because, Lord, the time has come, Lord, that, God, greater things we will see. Thank you, Jesus. We are blessed for this day, this timing that we are in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. You know, I think today is a very important day. I feel that tonight, as the next gen and the older gen, two generations begin to release and voice the concerns, there's a common thread, and that is the next gen is definitely ready to take over or rather ready to step in. And I, I want to release this to the older generation. Never, never say to yourself, you can't find them. They're actually inside your churches. But as we heard even Rachel say, allow them room to make mistakes. Be, do not thrash them when they make mistakes because God never thrashed us when we make mistakes. And as long as you guide them, you stand beside them. And you know, for the younger generation, do not be... You know, my church is also going through a major transition. I like, in fact, all the preachers now are the next generation. And you should hear them preach. You should hear even this 26 years old preach this weekend. He preached on the holiness of God. You really should go and listen to him. It's a Saturday sermon. And all the older generation was astounded that he could make everyone rise up to, tra and to, to say that indeed, unless all of us learn to worship God, as God demands. Wow, for a 26-year-old guy to say that to all, they are ready. But the younger generation, as one of them preached, must not be in a hurry. Transition takes time. Transition takes trust. Transition takes testings. Both the older generation and the younger generation will be tested in our relationship, not in our skill sets, in our relationships. Because it's a relationship, trust. Younger generation must trust their fathers. Fathers must trust their sons. And finally, there must be a time. Do not rush this. But having said that, we cannot. It's urgent, like Pastor Raymond said. There's no more time left. We are getting older. We don't have another 20 years. We only have five, three, five years. And so tonight, even as we want to tell every church leader, the mantle of passing the anointing to the next generation has already begun. So, Father Lord, we thank you what you're doing. We thank you, Lord, for this watch, this call that you've come upon us. Father, we thank you, Lord, that there be no next generation gap in every church, in every prayer movement, in every organization, in every, even, yes, raise the next generation of evangelists, apostles, prophets, teachers, yes. pastors. Oh, Lord God, they are there Amen. already. So, Father, help us to Amen. identify them, help us to encourage them, help us to cause them to rise up. So, in the name of Jesus, let all arise. Amen. 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 Father, we want to thank you too for our beloved brother, Timothy Lowe. We want to thank you for the work he's done in blessing Amen. and our building generations of young people. Truly, he has built the next generation to be ready to take on the mantle. Father, we pray that you'll be with him and his family. Truly, O oh Lord God, in all of us are saddened by it. But Lord, we know our brother's work is complete. So we give you thanks, we give you glory for this glorious work you are doing in Malaysia, Lord God. Let, ever, let us never be faint-hearted. Let us realize that every time we take a slot on the altar, it is a gate of heaven that's being opened. So Father, I to bless every person taking the next 20 over hours of slots, O oh Lord God, another 22 hours, O oh Lord God, that the gates of heaven are being opened right now. Father, let the anointing flow, that the glory of the Lord come upon each and every slot that is taken, that the glory of the Lord will put possession of that very hour and every hour that is the gates are open, O oh Lord God. But the bless Pastor Andrew Sevnot from uh, Charismatic Family Church, O oh Lord God, as he leads the next session. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.